time it is. Uh, this is San Remmer back at Ye Old Foundry in the little office that I have. This is going to be kind of a short little video. I was uh, reminded by uh, uh, James Sheets, one of the guys who watches my videos, uh, that I had never put out any anything to do with degassing or or you know taking slag off of uh, or you know fluxing okay and he's right although it's a short subject it's something that you need to know because when you're you know this this has to do with melting your metal and and prepping it just before you pour it into your mold okay uh, the whole process depends on your furnace and it depends on the fuel source that you're using to melt down the metal okay for 20 years I mean for let's say 90% of my time in the Navy we used induction furnaces okay and it had a tendency because the uh, induction coil it looks like a regular it looks like a spring sitting on end right it, it goes down in helix and it's a pipe about so big around it has a, a skin of about an eighth of an inch and it's all pure copper right flowing through that pipe is a non-conductive coolant that uh, goes back to the main part of the furnace and is cooled down and goes back through it again and it, re it removes the heat away from the um, from the refractive uh, coating on the inside okay uh, when you're making your molten metal of course it's going to radiate heat whichever way you put heat to it whether it be from propane torch or oil fired furnace or induction furnace or uh, rocking indirect arc furnace or a resistor furnace or any of any of the oh uh, well that wouldn't have anything to do with it because it doesn't have a crucible in it but <clears throat> when I first was in the Navy you know I got in there uh, I geez I can't remember I think it might have been only at at uh, 32nd Street base where we had our molder a school our basic school for molding and uh, we had a rocking indirect arc furnace that they taught us how to use for a very short time uh, it was it was smoky it was loud I mean you know how loud it is most of you know how loud it is the uh, noise coming off of an arc uh, about this big around when you're welding well we had arcs inside this this big barrel but the arc itself was three inches in diameter okay so you had a fixed oh let me let me get a couple of things you have basically what looks like a big beer barrel laid on its side and you have a door that you can open up and put stuff in and close and it's you know it's it's a very basic machine on one side of the air of the barrel you have a fixed uh, electrode the other side of the barrel you have an electrode that's programmed to slowly feed in when you when it starts to sense that the uh, the arc is beginning to fail and in between these two three inch in diameter uh, electrodes you have a three inch in diameter and probably about that long arc of electricity okay now we didn't have like a 3,000 uh, 3,000 volt machine or anything it was 480 volt 480 or 440 can't remember which it was it was uh, let's say 440 volts of electricity but was um, you know brought up to enough uh, voltage uh, level that uh, with the elect uh, well it wasn't very le much electronics it was electrical like transformers and stuff uh, the 440 was was uh, pumped up to what they needed to establish an arc a three inch arc I still can't remember I can't I can't get my my wrap my mind around a three inch arc even today 
and uh, once it you would bring the arc uh, rather the electrode in contact it would establish the arc and then you would back it off to the uh, just to the point where you might start losing your arc okay because it wouldn't be able to jump that gap we had that as a as a heating uh, you know system as a furnace okay that's one of the weird ones that we had it didn't last long it had problems uh, and dangerous problems that uh, for instance one of the Jesus I wish I had something neat oh yeah okay let's say this is the furnace rocking indirect arc it rocked like this on a big on a big uh, you know yoke it had motors on it and it made it 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 made it rock this way it made it rock this way so everything inside when it melted was all being mixed thoroughly you know uh, and the problem that it would have sometimes is that if there was the opening was right here it's supposed to come down touch a limit switch and that tells the machine to rock it back the other way once in a while that limit switch would fail and it would just continue to keep going until all that molten metal rolled right out of that that uh, out of that opening right onto the deck and you had you had terror and you had fire and you had the decks would would buckle uh, decks would buckle yeah buckle you know and, and swell and it was terrible so they finally got rid of them and got brought in and they bought the the latest greatest which was the induction furnaces okay when you melt your metal all right it doesn't make any difference whether you've got brand new ingots or you're you're melting down scrap or if you're you know making your own mix up any of that stuff that's going to be in the crucible is going to have a layer of oxide on it whatever the material might be it's in time it's going to uh, develop its own layer of oxide if it's unless it's in a vacuum all the time and it's never touching oxygen and so but that doesn't happen uh, anywhere in most of all foundries okay so you're gonna have all that you know it's gonna be an oxide on the outside now what's an oxide it's the material that you have combined with the oxygen in the atmosphere and you know at least one of the oxides there's no doubt about it rust rust is an oxide it's an iron oxide okay uh, you know what rust looks like it's brownish it it starts you know if it's a nice nice smooth piece of metal eventually it buckles and makes holes in the metal it ruins the metal all metals and and metal additives have a certain percentage of oxide on its skin you don't want that to be transferred into your casting uh, it would just be it, it would ruin your casting okay you want the pure metal let's say you're pouring brass you want pure brass going into the the mold and filling up your mold cavity and making a nice beautiful uh, mold I mean rather casting right well you won't you got to get rid of that uh, that oxide okay for the most part well, even even with uh, an induction furnace that mixed this stuff with the uh, the magnetic fields it was generating, you eventually had to have you know once you turned it got up to the temperature you needed it, it's time to uh, clean the metal out. You would get your scra your your scraper. You would go up and down the inside of the crucible, knocking the stuff loose that had been pinned against the crucible by the magnetic fields and all the oxides and maybe paint and maybe burnt up grease and uh, whatever you might have been using the nastiest of scraps all that stuff that was on the outside of the scrap uh, will come to the surface but it's not going to be pure scrap okay it's going to be combined uh, with uh, some of the good metal so you need to use a flux and what a flux does is that it it cleans the metal 
and ha all the bad stuff, all the oxides, all the slag that has been formed on the top of the uh, molten metal, it almost like it congeals together. It almost like it attracts each other where you can more easily scrape it to an edge of the crucible and then dip it out and put it and, and put it, get it out of your way or then remove it okay from the uh, from the melt and then you have nice clean metal you're not going to get a hundred percent of it out because there's always a little bit that seems to surface after you've done all your cleaning and so basically what you do at that point is that you just shove it to the back of the crucible where it won't be drawn in the uh, you know the metal when it's pouring it won't be pulled in with that and go down into your mold cavity okay you just push it to the back of the crucible it'll stay there uh, and you just pour your molds all right now there's certain materials that you use that does the best job at uh, making slag can you know come together to where it's easily taken out in the Navy what we had for brass and bronze is we had what was called PC tubes now what's a PC tube well it was a copper tube almost like copper foil that they poured these phosphorus copper pellets into and they you know uh, folded it all up to where it was a, a nice little package you would tie it to the end of a of a degassing uh, rod and then when it came time you would plunge it to the bottom of the melt the uh, copper would melt through you know would melt away it would release the phosphorus copper down there phosphorus copper would make a churning you know it would it wouldn't add anything to the metal its only job is to churn the metal and to, uh, to release the gases that might have been trapped inside your metal the de degassing is is the main thing we used it for and uh, you know we clean all the the uh, slag off the top and then we'd go pour our, our stuff now for for aluminum we had a degasser that uh, I don't remember the name of it okay I'm, I'm relatively certain that that it's uh, probably the stuff that I bought from uh, the budgetcastingsupply.com for degassing aluminum basically what it was it was a tablet okay about so thick let's say half inch thick and about two inches in diameter and it was and it had a hole through the middle of it so that you could put it on the end of your rod and tie it you know uh, use some copper wire or something like and tie it to the rod and what you would do is you would take it down when your metal was ready of course your aluminum was ready you would take it down to the bottom of the of the heat of the molten metal and you would stir it and the material that this was made of churned the the, the you know it it was like uh it's like somebody bubbling you know taking an air hose and bubbling down on the bottom of it right which you can't do because you've got water in the LP air so don't even try that so but this we wouldn't use the entire uh, tablet up it would just we would just go for a little bit like maybe five seconds four seconds pull it back out scrape the side of the crucibles and uh, you know scrape off um, clean the slag off of the top of the metal and then go pour it right okay that's what we used when we was in and when I was in the Navy also let's say in I remember off the top of my head for every hundred pounds of steel that we uh, poured we would take one ounce of pure aluminum and uh, we would we would plunge that to the bottom of the heat and that sudden expansion and melting of it would churn the metal also and uh, you know that would be degassing the um, steel uh, right then and uh, then at that point we would put the flux on top now the flux you, you got a, a hundred fluxes you can use for stays for steel okay uh, we didn't do so, do so much steel that I can remember we used to buy an exothermic topping that would uh, that would you know flux it 
but that was out in San Diego, and I wasn't the one who bought it, so I don't remember the name of it. If you use a lot of, if you melt a lot of steel, you got you got your you got a list of things that you can choose from. Uh, Manel. Now, you if you, <coughs> pardon me, if you saw the Manel film that I made a video that I made, uh, you know how valuable that is. Uh, we had to degas that too, though. See, very hot metal, very heavy metal. We had to degas that too, and believe it or not, we used ma magnesium to degas that. Don't ask me how much uh, how much we used. I, I seem to recall that for a hundred pounds of Monel, there was a, a magnesium, let's say an inch. In diameter magnesium uh, yeah magnesium magnesium rod that we would chop off about that much drill a hole in the end of it put the rod in there and then when it and, and warm it up always whenever you're getting ready to do any of this stuff always warm up the stuff you're gonna plunge before you do it you never know if you've accidentally gotten some moisture in there you don't know if the stuff you're using was moist when you put it in whatever you put it in you might have wrapped it up in aluminum foil and and put it on a stick or on a rod on a steel rod plunging it in there you don't know if that stuff is a hundred percent dry and you're gonna have a little miniature steam explosion if you don't make sure it's a hundred percent dry so please put it over your heat while it's heating up let it dry out th uh, thoroughly okay now uh, and like I was saying we used uh, a bit of magnesium to degas a really hot, really, really uh, heavy metal called Manel. And uh, I don't recall what else we, you know, we used the blue uh, donuts, we might call, we called them. We used phosphorus copper for uh, brass and bronze. We used aluminum for steel. We used mang manganese for uh, Monel and iron was you know we didn't pour a lot of iron we made steel from the pig iron that we had so we used the aluminum to degas that now that's not the way it's always been in history okay our ancestors uh, the uh, the ancestors molders and foundry men and furnace operators they tried everything to get rid of uh, you know gas in the melt and to more efficiently get rid of the slag that's on top of the uh, the molten metal to so it was wouldn't go inside the mold cavity um, oh by um, you can buy by the way you can buy the phosphorus copper and the aluminum degassing tablets I think there are tablets from budgetcastingsupply.com okay that's the source I will use once I start doing brass and bronze I'll get phosphorus copper from them I'm not the, sure the the form in which they're going to uh, come in they might just be the phosphorus copper uh, BBs and you have to put it you have to make your own amount I don't know if they or if they do may they might come in the little uh, phosphorus copper tubes I'm not sure but at least that's where you can get them from budgetcastingsupply.com okay and no I don't get any any money from them to uh, uh, you know put their name out there I simply that's the only source I, I know that you can get those two items for brass and bronze and uh, for aluminum right right now uh, you got big companies that's got all the stuff you need for steel and cast iron but uh, you'd have to find their suppliers or their you know the people who handle their their material and you'd have to look that up yourself well as I was about uh, as I was starting to say our ancestors used all kinds of stuff and it and some of it uh, worked and some of it didn't for aluminum one of the flux and and uh, these things that I am about to tell you about I got out of what was called where is it I wrote this down ding 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 oh 
called The Foundry Magazine, and it was dated 1910, okay? And, you know, they were still all the time looking for stuff that would work even better than the previous stuff they had been using. For under the, under the heading of aluminum, they said a, a good flux is zinc chloride. Now, we had zinc chloride that was uh, powder in a, in a container. So all you would have to do with that is to uh, sprinkle it over the top of it. That would grab all the bad oxides and bring it into a kind of a ball or in, into a patty kind of shape, and you'd be able to scrape that out of there. They said fluorospar was one of the best fluxes for general foundry work. So you would use, uh, oh, and by the way, fluoro, fluorosparos, also known as fluorite. Uh, you'd be able to use that for either metal, apparently. It didn't, it says general foundry work. It didn't say only brass and bronze, and it didn't say only aluminum. Now, the stuff that I got for the aluminum, come that which came from budget casting supply, it came with a an industrial safety page here, and remember it said uh, the uh, the Foundry magazine said that fluorite fluorospar was one of the best general purpose uh, fluxes. Well, here. It says exposure to dust or fumes of fluoride containing salts may present a significant health hazard. Okay, so fluoride, that's basically, uh, that's, that appears, and I'm not a chemist, so I can't tell you the 100%, uh, with 100% assurance, but it looks like they're still using fluoride or fluorite, fluorospar. Uh, all the way from uh, the you know way before a hundred years ago it looks like they're still using it for at least some items okay now for brass and bronze there's a there's a few different uh, things that you can use uh, the found foundry magazine says that two tablespoons for every hundred pounds uh, of whatever melt or brass or bronze that you're putting you're getting ready to melt uh, of salt plain salt you put it in the bottom let's say you're using uh, uh, you're making a 200 pounds of bronze you you weigh out two uh, four tablespoons of salt pour it into the bottom of the crucible first then put your metal on top of that okay and that'll act as a flux Borax is also use, usable as a flux. I already talked about uh, phosphorus, copper. So uh, what they, there was also a, a thing that they did is they made a covering flux. Now, uh, until you have a, a good sized batch of molten metal, it doesn't seem like there's a whole lot of absorption of, of atmospheric gases either oxygen or in really bad for brass and bronze because of the copper hydrogen out of the atmosphere um, it's I, I can't stress how badly hydrogen is absorbed by brass and bronze and co you know because of its copper constituency copper you try and, and melt down copper uh, and you pour it into an ingot and you chop it in half just to see the cross-sectional thickness of it, you will have bunches of gas bubbles all through that. And it'll all be hydrogen. Because, you know, copper draws in hydrogen like a sponge. Okay? What they used to do to counter that is that you would make a cover flux. Okay? Uh, it would not only act as a flux to uh, try and, you know, accumulate all the bad stuff up on top, but it would act as a barrier between the molten metal and the atmosphere, okay? Uh, most important for brass and bronze. There's two different things that they used. They would use charcoal, they would crush it up into a powder, and they would put a small amount in the bottom 
at first, put the metal on there. When it was uh, like half full of molten metal, you would pour more in there to you know, scatter it on there. And once the rest of the metal was all molten and it was come up to the level that you were going to, uh, it was going to stay at, you would pour more uh, uh, charcoal on top to act as a blanket and a barrier between the atmosphere and the molten metal. Okay. But not only did they use charcoal, they used crushed glass. Crushed glass is is nothing more than uh, silicon that's been melted and then put in, you know, made clear and made into a sheet of of whether it be a, a pane, uh, you know, a window pane or a glass bottle or any of the other things that you know that are made out of glass. They just crushed uh, silicon powder or silicon into a powder and heated it up and made glass that way. Well, the same thing happens if you put it into a crucible where you're going to have molten metal. Eventually, the stuff does melt, but it's lighter than the metal. It's e it's uh, silicon is even um, a certain percentage lighter than aluminum. Okay, so it'll melt in most cases it'll melt and act as a molten barrier almost like pouring uh, a wax over your preserves your preserves to act as a barrier against uh, germs getting in there well the uh, the um, crushed glass will float on top of them on top of the metal as the metal accumulates down in the bottom after it's molten it has melted and it'll stay on top of that molten uh, metal and after everything is all molten it'll still be there floating on top and I don't know how long it takes for that stuff to turn into uh, molten glass but you know if you've ever watched anybody work with molten glass you know the stuff is once it gets to a certain temperature it's it's turns into a very thick viscous material okay uh, so come time for you to to uh, clean the metal up you've already got molten glass on top of it uh, all you got to do is just accumulate you know gra scrape that stuff to the side it'll start congealing right away and you just lift it up and take it out there it will already have wrapped around the slag that's up on top and you'll be able to once you if you take all that glass away you'll be taking the vast majority of the uh, slag out also and let me check my notes on this so you got you got lots of places where you can buy some of the most effective uh, fluxes and degassers oh there's another thing another way of degassing and we never did this in in the in the foundry uh, because it would just mean that we would have to buy uh, more stuff and to, to do this safely. You can oh, there's um, old foundry guy over there in Australia. I don't think I've seen him work with anything other than aluminum. I don't think, but for the vast majority of the work he does is in aluminum he's got a large aluminum uh, crucible and uh, furnace set up and what he does to degas is that I don't remember what gas he used I think it was argon but I'm not sure but uh, what you can do the you know the, the churning that is uh, produced by by uh, slamming the degasser into the bottom of the not slamming you need to plunge it you don't want to hit the bottom of the the uh, the crucible because yeah I don't know how good your crucible is going to be but you plunge it into the bottom of the crucible in the molten metal and it churns everything and and the vast majority of all the gases that were trapped in the metal will come to the top and you'll have nice clean metal well here he has a, a non-reactive gas because I can't remember if it was argon or not 
but he has a non-reactive, chemically reactive gas that he has a uh, a flow meter, I think. He says he's at least he's got a um, he's got some kind of uh, equipment that regulates the gas. Goes down uh, in the hose goes to a probe, like a, just a regular like stainless steel pipe that you might put down in the bottom of the uh, molten metal. He turns it on and he lets it churn, and he lets it churn for quite some time. Uh, he never said. I don't think he ever said how long he keeps that on. But when we did it out in San Diego, we just put it down there, went around a couple, three or four times, and then withdrew it right away. Less than ten seconds did we have it on. Uh, did we uh, introduce the gas? Okay couple of things to remember that if you've got access to gas that's great but it's got to be a, a gas that is chemically non-reactive to any material okay uh, like argon any of the gases that that flow over welding beads that acts as a blanket against the rest of the atmosphere keeps the the molten metal from absorbing uh, you know anything out of the atmosphere like oxygen uh, what are, uh, there's like three or four different types of gases that you can use but the key is it can't be reactive chemically reactive to any material it's got to be a, a dead uh, re, uh, almost got the gosh darn name non-reactive let's say that and uh, it got it, it has to be uh, has to have been put into the the bottle that you have dry okay uh, it's got you got to certify that it's a dry gas can't have any any even if it's in vapor form can't have any uh, um, water go into the bottom of your of your molten metal how bad would that be this would be the whole thing might come flying up out of there and not only burn you to death but burn up your house or or burn up the shop that you're in. So you've got if you're going to use this, if you you know it's and it's a, it's a it's a well known and used uh, effectively used technique to get the gas out of your metal. It's got to be non-reactive, like argon, and it's got to be a dry dry uh, gas, no moisture in it whatsoever. Okay. And let me check my notes make certain that I've covered everything that I wrote down uh, you, you know you could go to college and and have this you take a course on this 40 hour a week college course but this is just uh, the bare bones aluminum closing clyde floor cover flux they touched uh, talked about I mentioned borax is useful as a flux. I've never used it before, but according to the uh, Foundry magazine of 1910, borax is useful as a flux. Okay, and that's all the material that I was going to cover. Uh, as I said, it was it's not going to be a very long um, video, uh, but it it's a a section of the foundry trade uh, it's a subject of the fa in the foundry trade that you have to know to be able to make uh, the best castings okay so to everybody out there uh please leave comments please if you have any questions ask them if i don't like it like we were always taught in the navy when you're a senior petty officer or chief petty officer if you don't know the answer take tell them that you'll find out for them if you don't know know the information already okay so if I don't know what you want to know I'll find the information for you if it exists okay um, I'll try my best okay so uh, please pass the word about these videos to anybody who's trying to learn the foundry trade to make if they're an artist and they want to use molten metal to make artistic stuff okay we used artistic stuff uh, rather we made artistic stuff when I was in the Navy too not just 
brass and bronze impellers and pump bodies and wrenches and we, we you know we made artistic stuff too like plaques they're basically artistic uh, stuff they don't have any real mechanical application in the Navy they don't help anything run uh, they don't help uh, you know the Navy ships from being hurt by any any uh, bullets or shells or missiles or anything like that what they do do what they do for the sailor is to bring up their uh, morale because they got one not everybody got one okay um, and that's the end of that so please pass the word to everybody about these uh, videos um, enjoy the videos don't forget if you're, you're just watching if this might be your first video if you want to learn as much as you possibly can to do the very best job you possibly can on making castings start with video number one and work your way towards this video okay I start off with the most basic information in the beginning and and I work up to slightly more sophisticated techniques and slightly more sophisticated information and until you learn almost as much as me if you if you watch all of these you'll be uh, knowing as much as me okay so I'll see you later guys and gals and gals I know we got our ladies out there too we had lady molders female molders I don't know what would be the proper way to do that to say that these were girls in the foundry and the vast majority of the the girls in the foundry that uh, I ever met did just as good a job as the men they simply weren't as strong as the men which in our foundry you know you had to be kind of strong but still a gal can get just as strong uh, as a guy you're just not gonna be I mean you're not gonna have huge arms or anything like that or you're, you're gonna be uh, eventually you're gonna be a strong tough person if you're doing this work all the time okay um, <laughs> I guess that's all I can say good day ladies and gentlemen and uh, please uh, keep your eyes open. I'll have more videos coming your way. See you later.